So I just want to start. You wrote a chapter in the new book, and it was about central pattern generators and TRE and how that is an explanation of how TRE may be working in the human body. Can you explain what are central pattern generators? Yes, I wrote that uh, book for the reason for the, the chapter for the reason mainly that um, we always for years now tend to be speaking about the tremors from a brain perspective mm -hmm. rather than maybe from a, a more basic neurology perspective. And we have always been wondering about which are the neurological mechanisms which have are implied implicated in the in the generation of the tremors. And so one idea is to actually understand that a lot of what is actually tremors and basic movement patterns in the body, they don't necessarily require the brain and not even the cortex to be able to function because they are, in a sense, the product of some neural action, neural activity which happens in the spinal cord or in the brainstem too, but doesn't necessarily require a brain to be connected to it. Actually, science has even shown it doesn't sometimes be, require a body to be connected to it, in the sense that we can take out the spine from an animal and, uh, and see that it can actually generate patterns of neural activity which are rhythmic rhythmical so have to do with generating motor patterns which are rhythmical and so generate a behavior without um without having the organism to be intact so yeah. the idea of central pattern generator is actually defined as a neural network a neural network is like a a subgroup of cells of neural cells which work together as a network. And whenever they work together, they actually produce oscillations in their activity. They produce like rhythmic patterns. And these rhythmic patterns, since these neural neurons are then connected to muscles and uh, they actually, their activity produces rhythmical activity in the muscles. And so the idea of general pattern, central pattern generators as in introducing a, a chapter in, in neurology, which is not as well known for what concerns human movement and just basic rhythmic movement, which can be in a sense of aid whenever we are trying to understand how come so many different types of patterns and tremors and speeds of tremors can be can arise in a way that is actually involuntary for the person so they're not doing it they're not provoking it they're a bit like um, passively experiencing it because it's not strictly connected to what's happening in their cortex it's actually more a product of reflex reflects a uh, neurology which is more at the spine level mm -hmm. okay so you're suggesting that the tremors that happen in tre and even the potential myofascia movements or bigger muscular movements that occur along with the tremors is a communication from the central pattern generators located in the spine to the neural network that extends out or the peripheral neural network that extends out into the body is that correct i'm suggesting that whenever we are activating tremors and then they continue autonomously and now i'm talking about more those pattern of tremor that seem to have high frequency and that seem to involve the muscles big or small muscles and in a way that they're usually bilateral so there is like an activity, a shift of activity, including both sides of the body, which are sometimes the first kind of reaction people have to the exercises. So they 
are probably the most likely the product of these central pattern generators which are in the spine and what that also means that could explain why we have bringing in the idea of central pattern generator would fit also with the fact of why at the beginning we tend to have a more local reaction and with time we actually seem to have a spreading of this activity to other segments other than the one we just activated through the exercise because one of the other features of the central pattern generators is that they are kind of embedded in segments in the spine but over certain thresholds they start to activate each other so to cross talk with the lower with the higher and the lower ones so once a certain area it's this the, the pattern the the network in that area uh, reaches a certain threshold of activation it starts actually engaging and enrolling in its activity other patterns which are above and below that I don't think relates very much to what you termed fascial stretch in sense of more long, prolonged, prolonged and extensions of whole chain, fascial chains. So some, most often they are just on one side, they involve just one fascial line. And I don't think that in those terms that would relate much to the to the topic of central pattern generators. Okay. Because it has its own neurology in a sense. The fascia is already a neurally active, so it doesn't probably require the activation of the central nervous system and of the spine in order to create a fascial stretch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you say the central pattern generator activates more locally, more local movement or generic movement first, but then you say it kind of interconnects with above and below. Are you actually talking literally on the spinal column? Yes. I'm talking literally at the fact that movement generally is organized in, in chunks in some way, going, let's say, from bottom up in the spinal. So if you're thinking of a swimming pattern, for example, you have a like certain sequence of activating certain uh, metamers, so certain parts of the spine and certain muscles connected to that region of the body. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine like a wave you creating as a movement while you're swimming is actually due to an activity that also travels in the spine from one segment to another one and when it actually engages the next segment it has to shut down the previous one so that you can get like an oscillation an undulation yeah. so in a sense that's that's what i meant by by saying that there tends to be sometimes you know that people tend to start tremoring in the pelvis and then with time other segments connect and are activated at the same time however there's other times where you have a complete stopping on one segment and activating of a different one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, the fact that they work as a chain, which can be fully active or just certain uh, rings at, at one time. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so does that help give explanation to why some people might start tremoring in their pelvis, but then we see the shoulders move, but we don't see any type of movement through the core of the structure. It's almost like they're two separate pieces, but ultimately they seem to be able to pull themselves together. Yeah, I, I'm saying yes in the sense that the idea of having the movement the neurology for that area being localized to a certain area, a certain chunk of the spinal cord, explains why you can have these differences, why you can have a lot of movement in one and not alone and not at all in the, in the one next to it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can have an activation of the neurology and you have other areas which are they almost tremor actually start tremoring thanks to the help of the general activation you're act you're generating in the in the neurology of the spine mm -hmm. so it's almost like saying 
you are sending current through the whole spine and the areas which have for some reason a need or have a threshold which in that moment at that stage is low enough to be activated they actually start resonating too at that level mm -hmm. and that's why you can have big differences in having one area and a different one yeah what you're saying is um if you're talking exactly specifically about the pelvis maybe and the shoulders so the idea of like the gluteus and uh gluteus muscles adductor muscle hamstring compared to the trapezius muscles let's say um, those are actually innervated by very different nerves some are originating in the lower part of the spine some are originating in the cervical spine specifically the ones for the for the trapezius so that again i think tells you that if they do function together, this idea we can use of just sending non-specific current through the spine and see which areas are active is ultimately due to different nerves starting to function. Right. When you say non-specific um, uh, nerves or non-specific, what was it? I said non-specific currents in the sense of, in the concept of, let's say, we, we activate the neurology in some way through a, like a strong impulse because ultimately keeping the, the stress of the muscle for so long is a strong input, is a strong sensory input to the neurology. Right. And then we see, so we are activating this whole chain of pattern generators and based on the history of the person, based on the position they're lying in, so based on other sensory inputs, some will respond and with movement and some will not. Right. Would, would it make a difference as to which central pattern generator groups respond according to the contraction or holding patterns in the individual? Of course, because on one side we cannot see the idea of talking about the central pattern generators is a way to break down the neurological mechanism. Mm -hmm. But we always have to remember that it's a holistic organism we're working with. So in the sense there is mm, there is a crosstalk with the brain. There is the ability of a person to actually fully inhibit the tremor if they really put all their efforts in or to facilitate to some extent. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a, a crosstalk with what they're used to doing mm -hmm. in terms of movement patterns or tension patterns, may they be physical, may they be emotional because they are being repressing an emotion for so long. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are certain muscles pattern associated to that certain central pattern generators associated mm -hmm. to that emotional expression and so there's always another layer which is what the neurologists call the more habituation or sensitization of neural patterns this means that we are actually good at training some of this neurology to be hyper responsive or actually to stop responding to a certain uh, stimulus and so yes there is definitely a correlation with the history of the person and the way they react to the outside world for so long yeah when we see a change in the frequency of the tremoring is that part of central pattern generators as well activating stronger or more mildly definitely that's another feature of what we observe which calls a lot for the need for including the concept of central pattern generators because we know that uh, there is a modulation within the, the cpg and um, 
that involves the feedback so that the way the muscle is responding, the tension pattern in the muscle, whether it's changing while it's movement, feeds back a stimulus to the CPG, which alters itself, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, so, and then we also know that CPGs influence each other. So if in a certain moment, another one gets in, involved, included in this activity, it will modulate the first one, let's say. And also that they, they have different ways of functioning, almost like different gears, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense, that's intrinsic in the activity of a CPG to be able to function at different gears. Mm -hmm. So the, the movement is still the same, but it will shift from one speed to the other or be a bit more wide or a bit more restricted mm -hmm. as an intrinsic feature of that CPG activity. Mm -hmm. And all of that is in the service of helping the organism itself to restore some type of natural healthy communication between the CPGs and the, the larger structure. It can, because I'm not, I'm not necessarily fully convinced that that is always the case. And sometimes we are probably even um, activating the same pattern, which is so used to be activated, which becomes the way of least resistance mm. for the neurologist. And so the idea that by activating always the pattern of least resistance is necessarily a fruitful thing, that's debatable. That's... Mm -hmm. Does the operating the pattern of least resistance, does that explain why many people do TRE, say I tremor the same way all the time, nothing changes, etc.? Yes, I think in some way, uh, I, I don't, um, my take on that, so my personal um, take on this issue is that in a sense yes we are always using the same pattern so we are not necessarily retraining a good neurology we mm. are almost like getting stuck in a pattern right and um, one thing since you can imagine that you know in theory we do interventions to maybe help the person get out of it one thing i find very useful also is to once the person does have a pattern which they recognize as being the way of least resistance, there comes in the mental part, the brain part, where we actually start interacting that pattern. And I find very useful to actually teach people to put all their effort in repressing that activity. So in putting the cortex to try to control those central patterns. And I find that then you are actually inhibiting the way of least resistance. So in some way you are activating the neurology on the spine level, but you're coming in also with your awareness and with your focus to inhibit it. And what I see that many times that's a way how it starts happening at other areas which are not, um, that are not the usual ones. Mm -hmm. So there can be a cross talk between what doing that voluntar involuntarity to happen and getting in with a voluntary action, which can help shift that way of least resistance, let's say. Right. And then sometimes what we see is people repeat the same pattern over and over. So it's that, that pattern that you're talking about. Um, but then... Uh, maybe after the third or fourth time, it's capable of opening up maybe the shoulders as an example. Whereas it, it, for the first three times, it repeated the same pattern, but then mm -hmm. finally opened the shoulders. Is that when it was able to link up to another group of central pattern generators? I would think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That was wonderful. Now, I want to think of two different concepts here. So we have the spine with the central pattern generators. I want you to explain a little bit for us first, how do the central pattern generators move up into the connection with the neurology or the, the different parts of the brain and maybe what parts of the brain 
at its most primitive level so that you can help us bring those two different conceptualizations together. Um, is your question about how, in a sense, we are then influencing the cortex from the spine? Or Not is your just question the cortex, any part of the brain that are going from the most primitive communication of central pattern generators into the brain, which ultimately gets its way into the cortex and maybe into the motor cortex specifically, how do they talk to one another or work together so that we can understand it from its most uh, primitive to its more complex levels in the brain? Yes, of course, there is feedback mechanism between, we know, between the environment and the CPGs, between the CPGs and the effector organs, and then between the CPGs to the higher control neurons. So the central feedback to the limbic system and from there to the cortex. Mm -hmm. So there's, for example, one example could be the role of the insula. The insula is a structure in the limbic system which has a function to actually map or monitor in some way uh, represent create a representation of what's going on our internal environment and the internal environment can be a ph value but also a, a level of tension in our muscles mm -hmm. So we know, for example, that the insula, which is a part of the limbic system next to the amygdala and the hippocampus, this just to say that it has a connection with everything that is then emotional expression or scanning and uh, creating a reaction between how we feel in how inside and what's going on around us. So creating like a link between the inside and the outside. So, for example, the insula is one essential part on mapping our uh, internal environment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the insula, importantly, is also uh, an integral part together with another structure called the cingulate gyrus, another integral part in, uh, in other mechanism about how the brain functions. So mm -hmm. it's an integral part so this could be connected could be seen as a link between what's happening neurologically inside how the brain registers that and how the areas that register it are also involved in other tasks which are more brain tasks like uh, directing our actions based on our priorities or allowing us to be able to express how we feel inside. Okay, is that what gives explanation to somebody who's tremoring and they're doing fine, the environment's safe, but inside they start to feel anxiety and fear, even though that does not ex there's nothing dangerous that exists in the external uh, environment, but they're so, they can become so frightened that they need to stop the process. Is that happening through the insula and the limbic system, repeating some kind of memory from the past that's inducing a fear that doesn't really exist in the reality of the present moment? It could have a, it, I can see probably two potential ways. Like one could, yes, be um, a memory. So in a sense, what we are calling sensitization, the fact that that, amygdala has already been stressed and has been taught to react so well and so quickly that now a strong stimulation from the body through the insula with the amygdala together with it because they're both part of the limbic system may allows or induces the amygdala to activate itself at the same time mm -hmm. what this says though is that yes it could be part of the memory but we should also understand that that would be, should be the caution about how we shouldn't overstimulate ourselves. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not necessarily a memory, it's just that we are overstimulating the body oh. and through the spine, stimulating the limbic system too much that the amygdala is part of 
reacts because you're just calling for it. <laughs> That's, that's wonderful. That's really helpful because it takes that psycho-emotional state and actually explains it more through physiological explanation of the, the system just is getting overstimulated, which when the amygdala was overstimulated in the past was potentially something dangerous. In terms of whether this is the um, constructive for the person, I'm not sure. Right. And we're suggesting in, in an experience like flooding or dissociation or freezing, it isn't constructive. Exactly, yes. Okay. What role does the um, motor cortex play, if any, with the central pattern generators? I, let's, I can maybe bring a metaphor of like a car where there is an engine running, and so it's actually turning the wheels in a specific direction. And that would be the central pattern generator, meaning it's like a fixed way of coordinating certain muscles and certain segments of the, of the body. Mm -hmm. Then we said the gears, the gears in some ways, so that they are also part a feature of the CPG, which could be, however, modulated by how much sensory input or what kind of sensory input is coming from the body and from the environment. But at the same time, it's also, um, at the same time, some of this mechanism, some of this regulation comes from the cortex. Mm -hmm. so there's definitely gas pedals and brake pedals and the steering wheel, which are actually more a cortical function. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there is the ability to modulate it at some cortical level. We also know, however, that if you're, and this if you're talking about maybe about TRE and about vibrations, also seen in mass, like induced vibrations, mm -hmm. we know much better that if you're having a panic attack, you are not able to consciously repress those vibrations. Right. And that would tell you that at least in some levels, in some moments, the spinal core, the, sorry, the brain and the higher structure, the cortex, are not able to have a function. Mm -hmm. We also know that in a person who just has a transaction of the spinal cord in an injury, so we are actually disconnecting those two things. We are disconnecting the cortex from the CPGs in the spine. They have a lot of vibration, a lot of tremors. So it tells you that this shows you in some way that the brain is more there to modulate a movement, a function, which is then more intrinsically embedded in the, in the spine. Mm -hmm. So obviously both levels play a role, but just a slightly different role. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Okay, so let's now shift back to something we talked about earlier. So we've gotten the CPG and how the brain or the neurology functions in relationship to it. Let's move out from the... And would you call, is that the peripheral or the central nervous system? The, the, the all central nervous system, yes. Okay, so let's move to the peripheral nervous system then from this communication between the brain and the CPGs and the spinal column, and it extends outward. So we get in, uh, physical vibration. Sometimes we actually get movement within the structure itself that's clearly muscular movement, and then sometimes we get fascia releases which are occurring spontaneously through the structure. So can you break it down from the central nervous system out to the periphery? Let's talk about muscles first. How do the muscles actually move by the activation of the central pattern generators? What's the mechanisms in the muscles themselves? Well, you have to understand that when we are talking about also CPGs, we are still talking about one piece of a reflex pathway which you have between the muscle and the core spinal cord so the muscle will still have be activated by the neurology in the spinal cord and the spinal cord will receive a feedback from the muscles about how it actually reacted in between those there is the cpg 
So we have to create a loop where you will have CPG, motor neuron, muscles, sensory neuron, and again CPG. So the CPG is what activates the motor neurons so that the muscles can function, can actually move. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's a loop which involves both. Okay. When you're talking there. about the muscle or the, the nervous system com communication, are you talking about afferent and efferent nerves? I'm talking about sensory feedback, sensory fibers from the muscles okay. to the spine and from motor fibers from the spine to the muscle. All right. Can you then add for us how do we go from a CPG into a fascia, involuntary autonomic fascia stretch? How does that happen? I don't think we can really compare those two because mm -hmm. if you also based on experience, the fascia stretches seem to be more rare or not immediately the result of the the type of activation you use through the exercises mm -hmm. that seems more to be like a secondary process of when the muscle has changed then in a sense the fascia will react to it mm -hmm. and adapt itself through a stretch to the more relaxed muscle probably right so i don't think that's because uh, Imagine, also remember that everything that has to do with CPGs is defined as like rhythmic, quick oscillations. Mm. And that's not what we would <clears throat> term a fascial stretch. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, so that's a secondary movement that occurs as a result of other circumstances, neurological and physiological circumstances in the structure that have changed. Yes, or actually a direct uh, activation of the fascia, which is also a, a partially a neurological tissue. Mm -hmm. So they can go hand in hand, but you probably you can have also a fascial stretch independent of the muscle activation itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But okay. almost like a, so the muscle is then, the fascia is actively stretching and the muscle is passively relaxing or elongated through that fascial stretch or thanks to that fascial stretch. We're going to go back to the brain a little bit. What's happening in a psychological or an, and emotional component? We activate the tremor mechanism. Some people have a memory of some experience from the past that they relate to the way their body's moving currently as a result of activating the tremor mechanism. Other people don't have a memory, but they may have an emotion and say, I don't know why I'm crying, or I don't know why I'm afraid. And so how, how are these communicating and assisting one another and also separated from one another? I'm not so sure how to answer this question because I think there's so many layers of this process which is happening that will be in some way different, so much different in every single person that um, that it's hard to create uh, a thread that unites mm -hmm. all of those mm -hmm. experiences the way you just define them in two separate uh, uh, groups. Mm. Because ultimately, as we said earlier, you could even just be overstimulating the amygdala and whatever emotion comes out, that could be a memory and could have nothing really to do with the fact that maybe that area which is tremoring is connected to that emotion. Mm -hmm. it's just that it's a, a, a pathway, it's a loop that is used to being active or it's hyperactive because it, there has been a strong emotional uh, memory connected to it. And now that you are activating the whole system, like fueling it, that's the first one that reacts, but so it's not, I wouldn't make a, a clear connection that um, the part that is tremoring connected to a memory coming up is necessarily uh, a linked process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and the fact that in some people it doesn't happen, again, 
remember that we were saying that if we are also stimulating all the CPGs, the spine, and also we know about changing the vagus nerve probably or activating or stimulating the vagus nerve, those are both two ways to lines of communication with the insula. And the insula is in a very important structure actually. To, it's like a switch almost. It's part of a cortical mechanism which is, has a function in monitoring internal versus external environment and directing our actions based on our priorities. But it's also like a switch between the having to do something, the moving forward and ex executing some function, or the ability to stay quiet and have a self-referential process happening mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. remembering being involved in autobiographic memory. Yeah. So it's as if the insula is an intrinsic part between the brain shifting from knowing how I feel and what I experienced and going do something about it. Mm -hmm. The insula is part of the what's called the salience network, which is like a a part of certain mechanism called the intrinsic connectivity networks in the brain, and that has a really important function in um, mm, determining how stable you are emotionally or mentally. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you have a strong salience network then this means that you are not shifting without any need or control between doing something or re getting stuck in a memory in an autobiographical memory about how you felt in one time mm -hmm. and so any intervention any bodily intervention or any intervention that can help the amygdala to be more active sorry, the insula as part of the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex together with it uh, is actually an intervention we're doing. It's almost a neurological intervention which helps teach the brain to stay more uh, stable, to be more stable. And when that part is more stable, it will shift less from having to do something or feeling about bad about something. Mm -hmm. So if we stimulate the tremor mechanism in a regulated manner, we're actually helping to, to stabilize this intrinsic network? Yes, nowadays if you're talking about, for example, about PTSD, so yeah. if, we go, if we go just, um, you know how I said there is like CPGs, which are networks of function, which are like almost built in in the spine. We have okay. something similar also in the brain and in the cortex. It's okay. called intrinsic connectivity networks because they are networks of areas. So it's, we'll never be talking about one area just working alone, but one area is actually intrinsically connected. So it's physically, it has a line of communication with other areas, which may be far apart from it mm -hmm. and whenever one works and is active the other one is also active too and so there is at least three major uh, of these ways of these let's call them uh, cpgs in the brain uh -huh. one that is like the salience network which we know that if someone is suffering from hyper or hypoarousal like from ptsd you can do fMRI and actually see that that salience network is lab labile. It doesn't stay on very strongly. It, it's not strong enough to stay fixed in that mode. Mm -hmm. And when that's not strong enough, then it will shift spontaneously into one of the other two. One is the default mode network and one is the central executive network. So in a sense, the salience network, the where, where the insula, and so the things coming about from the neurology, from 
the CPG in the spine, the input from the body, the input from the muscles, the input from the fascia, that's all part of the salience network, which means the brain can be stable in one state. And it's not shifting without control into a state where it needs to do something, sometimes for no reason, mm -hmm. or a state in where it's, it's just self-observing it's the body and it's just reflecting about its memories without knowing how to act on it. Mm -hmm. So everything that is like the tremors is probably along with stimulating fascia, along with stimulating muscles, along with stimulating... Mm, I mean, all this neurological stimulation is uh, probably helping the salience network to be more uh, stable. Wow. That would, be, that would be my interpretation of mm -hmm. it. So now that we call about how to, in PTSD, restore the ability of these networks to be stable as part of helping PTSD or creating stronger emotional stability in a person or deactivating the constant anxiety that goes along with having the feeling of having to do something right by creating interventions that help each of these single states to be more stable mm -hmm. so it, does trauma or traumatic experience um, destabilize the salient network or weaken it or yes they it can actually uh, it can actually ha influence majorly any of those three networks uh -huh. so sometimes is uh, some person can have the being hyperactive because their central executive network is too strong, meaning it's, a lot, it's constantly running on a kind of program where I need to do something, or probably because the salience network is not strong enough and so it cannot fully kick in to mm -hmm. counterbalance. Uh -huh. It's always probably going to be a dysfunction. At, not a dysfunction in the sense that it's a... Uh, it's an injury, but it's more a, a, a mode of working that mm -hmm. becomes unstable. It shifts mm -hmm. like gears too quickly without uh, being able to keep one in a stable way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so nowadays we are looking in, in rehab or for PTSD in treatments in actually finding out which of those networks is damaged or um, unstable in a certain individual and then finding ways of specifically how with that individual retrain which could be reinforce or deactivate uh, those different uh, mm -hmm. intrinsic networks right so it could work for each individual one in a different way that's what right. i meant to say ultimately but yeah and it's interesting that everything we do on the body through the fascia through the muscles is a, a central player when I call this salience network is really the switch between these other, between these other modes. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're reinforcing that switch, we are actually helping uh, the mind also to be more stable. Right. Right. But as we said, sometimes trauma is just being constantly overacting to something that is uh, that is not as, as uh, bad as we perceive it. And so by helping this ability of the mind to stay more focused on how I feel, I actually will retrain myself to get out of that pattern. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, a person can have um, benefits in what is putting themselves always in a stressful bodily experience by learning how to uh, 
feel themselves more through the tremors mm -hmm. as a way as as one way that someone can do a self intervention mm -hmm. yeah um okay let's move a little bit because you're talking just reminded me of that one individual you did a uh um a research on <clears throat> you saw a difference in the cortical activity can you just explain that to us a little bit what yeah what we did in that um case was to use um, professional university let's say grade uh, eg to measure the cortex of this person body so there was a lot of increase in alpha waves which are let's say beneficial for the brain states to be more stable and there was a lot of activity in what is called the smr the sensory motor rhythm which is a rhythm that defines actually how much mind and brain can go along so the more for example smr you have the more you can quietly relax your body in a chair mm -hmm. a child with hyperactive disorder would have very little smr so their brain is not really able to just stay quiet not doing anything mm -hmm. so it was very interesting to see that those rhythms were intrinsically very much increased and um, stimulated by the tremors and that the effect was would perdure would continue even after the tremors so there was like an effect of stimulating the cortex which was not only which was not only happening in the moment that they were actively tremor, tremoring but which was actually more long lasting mm -hmm let's say it's a it's a correlate mm -hmm. the fact that the the person can generate or has generated more alpha and more smr has as a byproduct let's say as a direct correlation that their mind can be more quiet or that their body can relax more mm -hmm. so the tremor mechanism the movement the motion the tremors have actually helped the cortex to get into that state which is required to be able to feel relaxed and mm -hmm. re and calm and that state which is required to feel more relaxed and calm is the combination between the increase in the smr capacity and alpha waves is that correct yes those are two of the main factors mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think what i would from my experience and now it's like eight nine years almost that I've been working in this is really how i think people do have the tendency to feel that it's the tremors only themselves to do the whole job mm -hmm. but i think that the tremors are a means by which the person can get in touch more with themselves mm -hmm. so there is in in heart trauma so in anything that is like you've been working with soldiers with people who experience heart trauma there i think the mechanism of the discharge through a tremor is itself by itself a curative thing for the organism mm -hmm. but whenever we are extending these to people who are not as severely traumatized and so have a kind of basic level of allowing themselves to activate these tremors then i think it's it's much more important that we add ways to how they help get the person use that activation to feel themselves more mm -hmm. and one of these ways i found in my experience would be to take very often breaks and pauses even every few minutes because if we talk back to the brain what the strength of a person is actually how to shift those gears in a conscious way and so by helping the person to yes activate the motion and then go back and self reflect of how they feel about that after effect of that activation is a way of how we are helping the brain to be able to be more strongly uh, able to stay more in in those specific certain states mm -hmm. 
So I think if we are not necessarily working with really hard trauma, then the idea to make often breaks and start a session with self-reflecting about how I feel, which is activating the, the default mode network, shifting into activating the tremors as a, activating the insula and the salience network, let's say, and then going back to self-reflecting what that shifted in you is a way to help those two states to become stronger independent mm -hmm. and so the idea of if you're doing a group session for example of my experience is that taking giving the the importance of taking often breaks where you go back into making a, a register of whether something changed or not is it better to tremor five minutes stop and go into that self-reflective mode to notice if something has changed and then tremor five more minutes and do the same thing or is a full 15 minute tremoring more practical or useful or it's different for different people I, on one side it's obviously different for different people but i think on the safe and more constructive side it's training that ability to shift states what is really important for the brain so i would even say you tremor two minutes mm -hmm. you reflect one minute or half a minute right. you tremor again two minutes so doing that it's you know that's biofeedback ultimately we know that probably a way of saying it a, a practical example would be if i would poking you on the shoulder many times in a row out of 10 in one minute you would really really feel the first four or five and stop feeling the other five so they're not really making a big change in your neurology instead if i kind of leave more space in between those pokings i don't allow the the brain to habituate to that stimulus and so it's actually more productive in terms of making a shift that is lasting and mm -hmm. making sure that the brain can integrate all those 10 touches and mm -hmm. not just five out of them we know that one rule is also to avoid overstimulation or always the same stimulation mm -hmm. and so it's just applying to tre i think concepts that have been developed in other ways of helping the brain restore its function so it's okay. like a general it's a general law of how the brain functions that would uh, integrate it in TRE would suggest that taking often pauses is uh, more productive. Again, each time we're saying this, we're trying to like make a rule for everyone, which is hard to do, but yeah. probably trying out both those ways would be more constructive. Yeah, it's again, shifting between all, trying them all out those ways. So having a wider range of ways to work on yourself and that all have some, mm, all of them have some uh, reason of why one could work than another in a certain moment mm -hmm. and becoming more aware of what you feel like doing is an important thing Yeah, and how you want to but the secret is always in, in every kind of interventions is about increasing your awareness with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if you see that five minutes of tremor is you tend to have, as was called in the beginning, the, always the way of least resistance. Uh, so the usual thing, that's probably not readily helping your ability mm -hmm. to change in a neurological way we are not again by saying the tremor mechanism we are talking of so many different possibilities that can be very very different in one or the other right. so I, I think that there is a lot of people who call it differently or doctors good doctors or trained people as you know also from the experience of seeing each different individuum having a different reaction just to the 
to the standard set of exercises, or, or already that makes you understand how difficult it is to actually mm-hmm. have a, a definition that you can actually teach as I'm seeing this, this means that this is happening in the mm-hmm. brain and the neurology. And I think that's the difficulty of it. It's just that mm, the human nature, everyone's experience and nervous system is so different. Mm-hmm. And many times that these reactions happen spontaneously either in a therapeutic setting that is not a controlled one, is not an experimental one, or they happen so spontaneously that no one uh, thinks about how to study it. Right. So maybe with the TRE, you could be having like a standard way of activating this response uh, with the with the thought in mind that you may be activating different things in different people. And that's again, that wouldn't help you to find out what this really is and how we're going to study it. Right. And uh, again, the tremors that an animal is having right after the shock or the person is having during the shock, maybe on a hormonal <clears throat> level, much different than the tremors you may be having during a workshop. Mm-hmm. So then the problem becomes, what is what? Like, what are we doing here? I think calling them tremors, I actually personally like the neurogenic tremor terms mm-hmm. just because another way of the SITs, uh, which is like induced and therapeutic <clears throat> tremors are um, that induced I don't like the term because I would think evoked should be better. Mm -hmm. That therapeutic is another thing that is a bit, uh, you're implying that it's a therapy or that it's necessarily uh, beneficial. And so I actually like the more general neurogenic terms because it's just say, we know it's an expression of the body of the, the neurology. We probably don't have enough um, definitions and not enough or a, a, the best proper way on how to put it in a category especially because there may be more than one category where this fits in mm-hmm. like you would have someone starting a session and having just maybe some tremors little shaking happening and then going in, in a strong uh, expression where suddenly it's uncontrollable and suddenly it's almost like a little bit of panic attack. Mm -hmm. And we have ways of how to help that and guide the person through. But probably those two, the beginning and that reaction wouldn't be able to fall under the very same medical terminology because they imply different things happening in the brain and the body. I remember Bob Skera saying, making the neurogenic tremors to change or to create a a different category from the psychogenic tremors, which are tremors that happen in the body and which are related to a history of somatization and which are most importantly, not a result of a brain lesion, for example. Mm -hmm. So I haven't found after many years that my solution to it, I prefer to just call it neurogenic based on what uh, Bob Scare had proposed and that satisfies me at least. Right, right. But it's a ill-defined category. Right.